All right, so we are continuing with appearance, material, and textures. We started looking at the material node today, so we'll continue examining the many fields that are in material, and then uh, take a look at two-sided material, see how that differs. So uh, once again, material is one of our uh, most important, most frequently used nodes. It's a, it's, it's a real workhorse. And so uh, we apply material uh, against just about any geometry. And uh, that's how it's colored. It's more than a simple color. It's also whether there's a glowing aspect, a transparent aspect, whether there's uh, bright specular highlights on it. And I should note that uh, even if you're putting image textures or movie textures on something, we'll often give it a material anyway as the uh, underlying basis in case the uh, image doesn't show up. So definitely an important node to master. And uh, the uh, two-sided material node is one that we uh, uh, recently added that uh, is nearly identical. It simply uh, deals with the fact that polygons can have two sides and so uh, this lets us color both the inside and the outside, or the front and the back, directly. And uh, it's important to note that, uh, of course, whether there's a back or not isn't guaranteed. We see in some geometry nodes, there's a field called uh, solid that says whether or not the uh, inside is drawn. This uh, slide was just uh, recently updated. so. You should see this in the next round when it goes up. And I think, uh, let me just check the order here, see if we're going right. Yeah, that's fine. Okay, so um, this is a uh, good time then if we want to compare the difference between material and two sided material we could use the uh, X3D specification. So uh, let's look at that. If we go to the notes for this page, we do have uh, a link here. To at least two-sided material, let's bring that up. I think I'll add a similar link to the material slide. And so let's get those right now. Uh, two sided material. Uh, was this link in the latest version of the slides that you guys had yet? That might have been one I just added. Uh, why don't we? Put that into the chat room. Is it in? Are you? Are some of you seeing it in the notes? It's in the notes section. Excellent. Great. Could you paste that into the chat room then for anybody who's having trouble finding that? Uh, and let's see if we can't suss out the actual URL. There we go. Uh, we'll stick that one in the notes for convenience as well. Okay, so we can see uh, listed here in the X3D spec uh, just what that is. If you want to find this and you don't have the notes handy, let's look at the other way to find the spec. We go to X3D Edit and the Help System, and there's a whole section in there on X3D specifications. If we click on the header here, it gives us uh, the URL of the online version. So that'll pop that up in my browser, or in your browser. And then uh, there's the uh, top of the page, X3D and related specifications. It's actually the very first uh, link in the table there. 
So architecture and components. And then we see the various clauses. We'll find, uh, let's knock the font down just a little bit. And take a look in the shape component, component 12. And sure enough, uh, there's material and two-sided material. If you don't like this little header that's up in the top here, this isoism, you can just use your browser to select only the, uh, the uh, bottom frame instead of uh, both frames. And so, material. The other way to get to the spec if you're not online is you can open up the Java Help tab here and we see the very first one is abstract functionality. There's the primary spec and all the specifications are bundled. You might have to, you might have to load on your uh, binoculars to read this font. We haven't figured out how to fix the font yet. I think we have to change a style sheet, but uh, depending on your system, you might be able to read it just fine. And no doubt we'll fix that sooner or later. Okay, so different ways to get to the specification. When we look in there, we see definitions like this for the fields and then we see a bunch of pros so one way to say hey what the heck is that ambient intensity field is just go straight to the specification and unlike certain books you don't have to pay a penny for that it's uh, it's all free online royalty free usable for any purpose and that's that's why we've gone to ISO International Organization of Standards and so you can uh, see not only a definition but also a lot of the technical details. Uh, diffuse color once again is our primary one, reflects all X3D light sources. And the more the surface faces the light, the more that the diffuse light is reflected. Okay? So we see in just these handful of paragraphs here both the good news and the bad news about the uh, specification. One is it's, good news is it's very detailed. Bad news is, it's very detailed. And so unless you understand the interrelationships, the definition may or may not be clear at first. So it takes some time if you're just working through the specification. Hence, all of this teaching material, learning material, so that uh, you can get a grip on it. Nevertheless, I do encourage you guys, uh, any, any students, guys and gals, to uh, look at the specification periodically. Get familiar, if not what it, if maybe not with every detail of what it says, but get familiar with what's there. What kinds of things are covered, because uh, it's always good for a second opinion on any subject. And in case of controversy, it's the final opinion on any subject. And if the final opinion is not good enough, then okay, great, maybe we found a problem in the specification and it's time to submit a recommended change and let the good old X3D working group sort through that of is there a better way to do things. Okay, so let's look at uh, these fields. We saw them here listed in the uh, material note. I'll boost the font a little bit and we can see each one defined and it's a pretty obscure syntax here it's pretty terse pretty almost uh, coded we might call this encrypted english uh let's let's dissect it and see what it means if we uh, uh, go to this slide which is dissecting what's different the differences between material and two-sided material, we can see that, okay, in the first column we have the field types. What is this? What is the strictly typed value for each? So therefore, if back ambient intensity is the name of the first one, then SF float says single field float, single value floating point. Similarly, the next several are SF color, single field color, that's the X3D type name for a three tuple, red, green, blue. Each value of red, green, and blue is in the range of zero to one. 
Okay. And then uh, the second column, in, out, stands for access type. So in this case, uh, uh, our access type is, uh, is input output. So we'll put a little explanation right there what the in out is. So we'll learn uh, later about access types when we define, find out how to define field. Basically it means it could have an input or it could have an output when you're uh, changing things. Then the fourth column are the default values. And a quick check here reveals that yes indeed it looks like our defaults are good that what's supposed to be a single value is a single value, what's supposed to be a triple value, SF color is a triple value, and uh, everything's in the range of 0 to 1. I did add a few more notes on this last night, uh, elaborating on that. A little fine point is that when you have square brackets around your range, that means the values are inclusive. If you put a parenthesis around, the value, then that means that value is exclusive. So for example, a parenthesis zero would mean any positive value above zero, but not including zero. You, uh, uh, construct you see a lot of times is uh, the range bracket zero, infinity, parenthesis, which means zero inclusive, value can be down to zero, up to infinity exclusive, we have no way to write infinity in there, but we could say any other value. So if we put those two together and we say what does that equal, I think a rephrase of that would be any positive floating point and to be even more precise, we could say any non-negative floating point. Okay, so yes indeedy, we're trying to be just that precise about what's allowed and what's not and how it will work. Okay, and uh, here's the slide showing the two-sided material. Now let's drill down into the material fields themselves. Since the two nodes are almost identical, everything we learned here about front face colors matches the back face colors. So, uh, as we saw yesterday in the first example, uh, diffuse color, excuse me, diffuse color is our most important one. And that's the primary color we see. The second one that we uh, uh, tend to use would be emissive color, where uh, that's whether or not it's glowing. And that's independent of whether you have a headlight or external lights in the scene. So that's sometimes handy for things that you always want to be seen no matter what but it's also something that you want to use quite sparingly because it tends to be overpowering. Transparency is the third primary one that we use whether or not it can be seen through, partially seen through, or simply opaque, meaning it does not allow anything behind it to be seen. So. Uh, Guess what value our transparency default is? Let's look. Let's go back a page and transparency zero, meaning not transparent, meaning fully opaque, meaning you can see it. Okay, so when in doubt about default values in the specification, 
you don't always have to look them up. You can just say, well, what is the least offending? What is the most productive value? What's the most efficient value? That's usually where the defaults land. So we could imagine if we went the other way and put transparency default as one, then everything would by default be transparent and invisible. Not a very uh, helpful language, not a very helpful default. So, so this is why we picked uh, the, uh, the norm for authors. Okay, so in our diffuse color example yesterday, we saw in the X3D edit tool that uh, we could type in numbers, we could also select a color from the uh, editor. We further saw that when we changed values in here, they would uh, appear down below in this uh, window uh, showing what our, we could expect our final result to look like. Now this little window itself here is, uh, is actually kind of interesting uh, in that it's uh, something we might use for all of the panels but we tended to just leave them alone. But because the fields aren't that complicated, but there's so many fields in material and they have such an interaction. I thought it was a good reinforcement for what the syntax looks like. You can also click on the uh, uh, .x3dv, the classic thermal, as opposed to the .x3d to see what a different encoding looks like. And one of these days we'll add, uh, what would a scripting version of those be? Okay, uh, next one, emissive color, glowing. Uh, take a look closely at this globe right here, this sphere. Hard to tell it's a sphere. It looks like a circle, or maybe a not a very good circle at that, one that's a little bit uh, knobby and not perfectly round. Let's back up a few slides and look at that sphere uh, with diffuse color. Notice here how the shading is variable. And yeah, you can tell it's a sphere because it's uh, darker around the edges while it's bright in the center, just as you would expect it to be from something that was uh, reflecting light. But since there's no reflection, since it's all just artificial light coming out from it that's overpowered any other component, we have no visual cues here and it just seems like a circle. Let's, let's pull up this example now. Okay, emissive color. And there it is, and let's undock the window here. So Alt-Shift-D to undock, refresh that thing. Okay, so now here we have it and I'm going to drag it around and you can just barely see the images changing. One thing we can tell is that, uh, gee, the circle's a little rounder. So if nothing else, XJ3D from the time we first took the pictures and now improved its default sphere tessellation, its default sphere modeling to uh, decimation into uh, multiple polygons. If you want to confirm that is it really a sphere or a flat circle, let's convert to wireframe mode, Alt-Shift-Double, Alt-Shift-W, and sure enough, uh, yeah, it's a highly tessellated, pretty round polygon. So what looked like even slightly rough edges before don't look quite so bad when you have all the polygons in there in a shading queue. I'll shift W to bring it back, but now when I rotate, click, drag, rotate, we can barely tell. And the fact we can tell at all is only due to the artifacts of the edges. <coughs> the points on the edges being not quite perfectly <coughs> round. Okay, so we'll redock this this time. Instead of using the hotkey, I'll just uh, click on the, the title bar there in the menu bar, and that brings it back in. 
So if we go down to our material and see what the values are, oh, this is interesting. Notice that we have uh, a diffuse color of 1, meaning 100, zero, zero, meaning red, and even a specular color of 010. Zero, zero. But did anybody see any trace of red there? Well, now we are. <laughs> so what's going on differently? Uh, well, from this side we're totally blue, and but the, on the other side we are getting some specular color. And so that's pretty curious. I'm not sure why that is. I see, I see why now. The reason why is because we have another light turned on here in the material editor. Okay, by default we're also throwing a directional light on there. So let's, let's zoom in on that a little bit. If I uh, do Alt-Shift-W in the little X3D inset, XJ3D inset here, we can see not only is there that sphere, but there are some vectors sticking out there. So, a little hard to see, I can't, well, maybe I can bring this up a little bit here. See, uh, the red, green, blue vectors are the X, Y, Z axes on our sphere. If we want to turn those off, we would click on this box right here. Okay, if we have uh, uh, a light turned on, then uh, here it is right there, the light's turned on. We also have in addition to the red, green, blue, we have this white line sticking out. That's our light vector. Disable, re-enable that. That's showing us the direction that the light, external light, is coming from. Okay, so this is a pretty helpful viewer, actually. So if we turn off any extra light, and we're just looking at it now with the spotlight, with the, with the headlight, the light that follows around the uh, user most of the time, then we can see that, uh, yes indeed, what we get is a flat blue sphere with no other colors, and diffuse color will have no effect, even specular color will have no effect until we start putting other lights in the scene. And even with those other lights, the blue will tend to uh, outweigh these other colors. So, interesting when you check out these combinations. Certainly if we thought we had a sphere before, it's pretty clear we have a sphere now. And I think as you try this yourself and click and drag and rotate this thing, when you get to control the change of viewpoints and mentally you're saying, I'm the one moving it around, the sense of 3D-ness really snaps in. And you get to viscerally, intuitively understand that, oh yes, I'm navigating in a 3D space, and it definitely makes sense. But there's a slogan, a uh, very famous slogan, that uh, if it ain't moving, it ain't 3D. If we look at this thing just by itself, right now there's no, no reason why somebody couldn't just paint that, or take a photograph of that, or a picture somehow of what it was. So. It's that motion often that snaps things in where your mind's eye can say, oh yeah, yeah, it's moving, I see the spatialness of this now. Okay, if we turn off our light again and experiment with emissive color, just changing values, we see that sure enough it's quick enough to change those things. If we turn it back on, the uh, emissive light on, then we can see that uh, the combination of effects can be pretty revealing, also pretty complicated. I mean, it can be actually quite difficult to find the right combination of colors. Okay, so moving on, this slide is showing obviously that uh, good old color selector that we've put in. Uh, actually, it also shows uh, uh, 
you can change the shape in there to any of the primitives if you want to see the difference in effect of lighting on, on different primitives. Now here's a good example of uh, our next field, specular color, which says if there is a highlighted reflection, what color is it? And then the corresponding term, shininess, which says if there is a reflected color from the light source, then what's our reflectivity of that color? Okay, so let's pull this guy up again in uh, X3D Edit, and we'll use the uh, editor to cover that. So <coughs> chapter 5, Appearance and Materials. Specular color. We've got a viewpoint. We've got a sphere. We've got a material. All right. And if we look at the, what this thing looks like by itself, see, oh, our sphere definitely looks nicer. And even when I rotate it. Um, We can tell that there's some underlying geometry on there and also tell that it's a sphere and it's rotating. Let's bring that up uh, very large so that even on the uh, come on big fella, what's going on here? Okay, there we are. So you can see it up close and personal here. There's still some underlying geometry that uh, manifests itself in there. This is a pretty, pretty highly tessellated, pretty well covered sphere. But we can see some of the artifacts in that, the underlying seams uh, based on the reflection of the specular color. We go back to the editor for material, click on the material node in the scene and edit it. We can uh, rotate around once again and see what this thing looks like, not just from the direction of uh, where the light might be, but from other sides. Okay, and so fairly complicated view here, complicated number, but that's okay. It's easy enough to change that. And then shininess, let's see if we can't control that red spot in there. Let's vary the slider bar for shininess. So when I go down to zero, it's almost completely washed out. When I go to a high value, the shininess is more and more focused, tighter and tighter. So the value of one, it's highly concentrated in one spot. And then it works its way back down. Where point two, it was actually kind of broad and then can get broader from that. This might be fun to look at if we change the shape and see where it matters. Here we can push shininess around and it's almost an all or nothing deal. It's, it's just ticks over right at the very last values because uh, these are all flat faces and basically not facing the camera. If I get them to face the camera more, then we see the shininess have more of an effect. But since the box face is planar, the shininess effect will be the same across that entire face. So that's why shininess is good when you have high, highly detailed models with lots of polygons where you want to get the highlights, you want to capture things like uh, the glint on an apple or uh, uh, a shiny spot on a car fender. Those, that's where specular color and shininess are particularly helpful. On flat planes, not so much. Let's look at something in between, either cone or cylinder. Um, see how our shininess varies. and. 
see it again. It's fairly rapid, but we can at least tell there's there's an effect here in the cone. Let's go to cylinder and start varying the shininess. And there we are back at our original point two, going lower, and you can see uh, uh, even better how the effect. Takes place. Notice how the shininess is essentially following us around from different angles. Okay, what else is there to say here? Uh, next up is transparency. So we have an example that uses a combination of transparent and semi transparent, excuse me, semi transparent and non transparent or opaque. Yes, question. I think something, if you're, if you're bringing stuff over from Blender, I know, I don't mm -hmm. know if it's true for the other geometry manipulators, the shininess tends to be a little higher than it needs to be. Like, I, I know I'm about run over, so it mm -hmm. really washes out a lot of... Uh, Interesting tip. So Blender tends to be shinier and maybe too high, and that you've got to knock those values down to make it usable. Uh, yeah, useful. well, it's, it's kind of tough then if you're looking head on or whatever, then I don't know exactly what your tag on it, but it just walk. If you look at stuff from an angle, mm -hmm. it comes out okay, but uh, looking head on, especially flat surfaces, it just wants to go to mine. Okay, so good tip. Watch your shininess when exporting from other formats, particularly Blender, and you may need to go in and edit them. Okay, so here we have uh, several shapes. Let's count up our shapes here. Uh, one, two, three different shapes. Look over here, sure enough, three different shapes. Now as I rotate this around, you know, let, me, uh, let me make it bigger. So I'll undock it. You draw it. Open it up. Okay, so as I click and drag and uh, using examine mode rotate this thing, you can see that the underlying sphere is indeed rotating as we go around. If I get a little lost, I just hit the home button which resets the, the viewpoint to its original pre-navigated values. Dragging more, we can see that uh, the box is partially transparent. Looks like the cylinder is not transparent, and this is actually a pretty confusing picture. Let's check on this guy. Okay, first we'll check the description. This example shows a partially transparent sphere in front of an opaque box and cylinder. Okay, so the box and the cylinder don't have any transparency. Let's confirm that. Here's uh, point 0.4, partially transparent, and that's associated with the sphere. And then we have no transparency on the box, and we have no transparency on the cylinder. So let's go back to that guy. So no transparency on the box and no transparency on the cylinder and so what's going on right now is they are behind the cylinder and that's why they're shining that way. Let's see if I can get them all in the scene here. Oh that's kind of curious. I did the fit all and that didn't work. Let's go back. Sometimes wireframe can help a little bit, but in this kind of thing where you're trying to figure out who's in front of whom, that may not help, and our fit all button is not working in this case. So uh, that's worth uh, logging in today's minutes that uh, for the transparency example in chapter five, the fit all function didn't seem to work. We'll post a uh, 
may bug on that. There's also a curious uh, construct in there for those of you paying particular attention. Uh, uh, right at the top here, we have a thing called extern proto declare and proto instance. And what we have in there is a node that's been written externally. It's it's really an extension to X3D. It's it's the X in X3D, and we've created a new node called Where Am I? And what that node does is, as we navigate, it prints out position and orientation of the uh, of the camera of your current viewpoint okay so this is a helpful little tool if you want to find out just where to put your own viewpoint you could uh, take a look in the console the way I got to the console was right here this little uh, let's mark it up here this little scroll it marks that the extern proto declare and the proto instance is where we define an external node and uh, uh, inserted them into our scene and then finally when we click on the console let's see if I can get that guy back up nope so I'll call it up let's see if we can save the ink this time no I guess not Get rid of it. Put the ink back on. Now we can look in the console window. When we click that little script button there, that's what uh, pulled up the console, and we got to read the output. So that's something. How we accomplish that, we'll show you later. But for now, I think it's helpful just to know that such a capability exists. So if you're trying to reduplicate your user experience after you say, "I know where to go in my scene, and I know where to look." could tuck, tuck in these two little utilities here and then find the values and simply cut and paste that position orientation in and get your viewpoint oriented located correctly. Okay, interesting example. So let's see what's left here on those transparency effects. Well, we've covered the fields, but now there's another uh, pretty major feature that we've uh, built in there because it can be hard to find the right material or the right combination of material values that match what you want we've exposed a, a, a very valuable resource right as part of the tool now this was initially done uh, uh, way back when over a decade ago for open inventor which uh, some folks may still remember it was a application programming interface developed by Silicon Graphics Incorporated, SGI, the famous uh, graphics hardware company of Jurassic Park fame and other things, uh, that uh, said, well, here's a bunch of materials and you could use those. And not only that, but uh, uh, we converted them into uh, Vermal and uh, then into X3D and we put them all online. So here's the web page linked to right from the uh, show notes. And if we go in here and look at some of these examples, then we find out that they're uh, uh, actually pretty cool and pretty interesting. And so we'll let it load here, see what we get. In the uh, example scene, what we're getting is a whole bunch of extern prototypes. Gee, the same thing we looked at just a minute ago. If we go back one, uh, we'll see instead of uh, examples that contain external prototypes we go right to the definitions themselves so if we wanted to know what the heck is autumn 17 we go in there and say oh okay there's autumn 17 it equals the following values Now, could you find those values yourself? Certainly. But good luck, and uh, uh, let me apologize now if I don't wait around for you to find the exact color of Autumn 17 or whatever it is that you might like. So let's look again at these examples and uh, see them side by side. Um, let's pull this into a full screen. 
and uh, it's a very clever way that the examples have set up these guys to uh, look together. And basically what they've done, uh, not sure why that's still loading there if the other one worked. Let's try it this way. Uh, here we go. I just didn't wait long enough, so it was a little slow. Uh, we have a checkerboard in the back for contrast, and we can see a label over each column. And if we click on the uh, label for each material, if, uh, if it will let me, it should seek us right in to that. And we're not seeing that happen. Let's try the normal version here. Okay, a problem with the link on that. Uh, when it works properly, I suspect this is a browser problem. So these are pretty well tested. You can click on it and it will zoom you right in to the color. Now something to note about these guys is that they're carefully chosen to be aesthetically pleasing, visually complementary, so that if you stick to one little library here, you could use any of the colors in this palette and they would tend to look good together rather than being clashing or uh, uh, displeasing to the eye. So the idea then is can we uh, take advantage of that? So what we did in X3D Edit is in the material editor here we exposed all these guys. So we started with this current color right here that has some transparency in it. We were just studying shininess a minute ago. Well, here we can go down and we can choose any one of these colors. So if we pick on Autumn again, select that, now I can just select with a slider here right through the bar. So we've made it easy for you to access those. You don't have to cut and paste them from the Universal Media Library, but rather you can just search around and say, okay, I want a metal of some sort. Let's find it here and pick it out that way. Here are the neon colors. Obviously there's a lot of emissive component in the neon colors. Okay, so material, two-sided material, universal media, selecting one of the library values. Here's some more snapshots of those to see how you can do it. Uh, finally we have the tool tips for material. So where are we? We're right here. We've now finished the, uh, the workhorse node on these guys. And I think what we'll do next is uh, the textures, texture nodes. And then finally, we'll backtrack on uh, line properties and fill properties. See you next time.